Cast is now saving. Attendees in listen only mode. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Meng Mengu in the Horticulture Department at Texas A&M uh, AgriLife Extension Service. So today is our part four of our uh, four-part series of the Crete Myrtle Bark Scale uh, webinar. And this is our uh, team. And this uh, part four is going to be chemical control. Uh, before we go forward, I want to introduce uh, some of our panelists uh, here today. Of course, the uh, two presenters. Uh, when I say your name, would you raise your hand? Dr. Mike Merchant uh, at Dallas, um, uh, Erfong Lafay at uh, Overton, and uh, Hong, uh, Dr. Uh, Gary Knox at the University of Florida, IFAS. Um, by the way, he's uh, covered in uh, mud uh, anywhere you can't see on the screen. <laughs> uh, I think, Ron, are you showing your screen? Are you showing your webcam? Uh, Dr. Dr. Chin, are you showing your uh, webcam? I can't see it uh, once I put on this uh, slide. So, okay, anyone else? Anyone else? Is Dr. Yan Chen? Yes. Is, okay, Dr. Yan Chen is also on the call. So Dr. Yan, are you there? Are you, are you, are you showing your uh, webcam? Oh, beautiful. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you for joining in. Uh, well, uh, I was going to use this uh, uh, picture, but since we have the webcam, so you can see who, you know, Dr. Mike Merchant and Dr. Uh, and Airfall. So in this picture, this was our, uh, this was our whole uh, CMBS team, you know, kind of first started back uh, 2014, or well, slightly before that. But this is Mike Merchant, this is uh, uh, Airfall, see how tall Airfall is, and this is uh, Susan, Susan um, is part of the uh, Great Myrtle Barks, uh, no, Great Myrtle Trail at the city of uh, McKinney. And I do want to mention one of our honorary guests in the audience, and that's uh, Mr. Uh, Neil Sperry. Uh, Mr. Neil Sperry has been very supportive of our project from the very get go. And then two of my favorite uh, horde agents, uh, Laura Miller in uh, Tarrant County and uh, Janet Laminack in. Uh, Denton County. Um, so again, this work is partially uh, supported by two uh, USDA uh, grants. Uh, one is a, a CPPM project and the other one is a, a specialty crop research initiative working on com uh, managing uh, crane myrtle bark scale. So this is uh, our um, a team of uh, a team members um, and more. And these are additional funding agencies of this uh, project. And uh, we have a dedicated uh, web site uh, managed by uh, Airfong. Uh, you know, a lot of our information, including the recording of this webinar, will be posted, you know, uh, on this stopcmbs.com on this web page. So hopefully if you want to review and also the previous three webinars, uh, the recording of the previous three webinars, we're also uh, posted here. So if you want to review those, if you missed those, uh, just come back to this web page, and you'll uh, find the recording and you know the, about uh, more any more information you know about our project. It's available here. So with that, uh, I'm gonna let Dr. Um, Mike Merchant start the day. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming and uh, sitting, being part of the, the uh, workshop with us today. Um, my name is Mike Merchant. I'm extension urban entomologist at the Dallas Research and Extension Center. And, and this uh, program is focused on insecticidal control of crepe myrtle bark scale. And uh, this picture is out from my front yard looking at my neighbor's uh, crepe myrtle tree just shows you why crepe myrtle is such an attractive plant for so many landscapers and homeowners. It's just a beautiful plant. Um, <clears throat> and uh, part of the reason of its attractiveness has been that it's been relatively pest free over the years. Now, we've, we uh, have had some problems with changing slides. Okay, hang on. Come on. 
There we go. We have had some insect problems over the years um, with crepe myrtle. Uh, first of all, uh, for many years, we've had a little aphid called the crepe myrtle aphid. It's actually a specialist in crepe myrtle. And you can see it in this picture right here, the, the aphids on the undersides of the leaves. And it is native to Southeast Asia, but has, has made the trip across the sea with uh, crepe myrtle and it has been uh, pretty much a persistent but especially in North Texas, northern areas, a little more of a minor pest. Um, the other pest, more recent, is the crepe myrtle bark scale, uh, also a native Asian uh, species, and um, it does seem to favor our um, crepe myrtle trees, although, as we heard in previous uh, broadcasts of this program, uh, it is it will feed and can live on other plants, including American beauty berry and pomegranate and some other species that uh, Dr. Gu's lab has been looking into. So um, this is the one we're going to focus on today, crepe myrtle bark scale. Basically it was discovered um, in uh, 2004 by uh, our, our lab and with the help of some uh, local tree care companies. Um, and this is the very first known infestation of crepe myrtle bark scale on a landscape uh, in Richardson, Texas in 2004. And you can see the the scale is the white uh, material all over the branches here and up in the upper branches of these trees and the the dark uh, blacker um, color of the of the what should be a nice honey colored branches of crepe myrtle is due to the sooty mold that uh, is a byproduct of the the scale feeding on the trees and in in some cases one of the worst aspects of this this pest on on crepe myrtle. Since 2004, the, the insect has spread throughout the southeastern part of the U.S., and we are seeing it uh, just uh, seeing a new re record in South Carolina this week, and uh, Alabama is, is reporting more cases in the northern part of the state, and it's just um, <clears throat> probably a lot wider spread than what this map shows. The insect itself is fairly interesting, and, and I want to give you just kind of an overview of some of the different life stages and, and sexes of this uh, insect. The large oval-shaped uh, felt-covered scale that you see right here, and there's several of them in this picture, are the females. Uh, female scales uh, initially uh, start out with this felt-like covering when they become adults, and underneath that scale covering will be the female and possibly some eggs. And as she uh, goes through her her breeding cycle, uh, she, her body is basically replaced with eggs underneath that scale cover. When it's mostly eggs under there, we call it an ovisac or an egg sac. So uh, those oval shaped insects are either the, the female or her eggs uh, on the bark of the tree. The longer oval shaped uh, objects are the males and the males actually, uh, scales will produce an adult male flying insect that, that um, will fly and find females and mate with them. Um, and also in this picture is more of a frosty colored smaller insect and these are actually the nymphs. The pri prior to forming a, a, a felt covering like you see on the male and uh, female adults in this picture, um, the insects do go through a nymphal stage. Now this, this slide shows the one slide, the stage that was not shown in the previous picture this is the crawler stage. This is what comes out of the egg. It's the very smallest uh, first life stage of the crepe myrtle bark scale. Uh, they're, they're small, they're very difficult to see with human eyes. Uh, this is under microscope on a, on a square centimeter uh, scale paper, piece of paper. Uh, we can collect these and, and monitor them by putting sticky tape, double-sided sticky tape around branches of crepe myrtle trees and then peeling that tape off, tape off, bring it back to the lab and counting the scales on those tapes. And it gives us an idea of when uh, egg, egg hatch is occurring in this insect. This is some data uh, just showing uh, crawler emergence uh, at one site in McKinney, Texas. This is data that's been collected over the last five years, since 2016. And you can see that um, we are right now, we're here in early July, 
and we're right in the peak season for crawler emergence, at least in, in this, our particular area in, in North Dallas area. Um, <clears throat> the uh, crawlers typically start emerging around the 1st of May, late April, 1st of May, and this is a critical time um, for uh, first generation of scales, and uh, it uh, peaks probably sometime in June and July in our area. And that, uh, that information will be, become relevant because the scale crawlers, relevant to our insecticide discussion, because the scale crawlers are perhaps the most susceptible stage to insecticides. So since the presentation today is, is focused on insecticidal control, I thought I'd kind of summarize the, uh, the options that we have for chemical control of crepe myrtle bark scale. And um, the first option we have is a short-lived contact spray that, that will kill crawler stage insects. And basically here we're talking about <clears throat> insecticidal soaps and insecticidal oils. They're insecticides that you spray on the tree. If they contact the insect, they can kill the insect, but they don't leave any long-lasting residue. Now, this has got all the advantages uh, that we look for, the very low risk to beneficials. Uh, a low risk of drift that could affect human health or other insects, beneficial insects. And it's why these products are widely available to consumers. Unfortunately, uh, as we'll see, they may not be the best option. Uh, then we have longer lived non-selective foliar and bark sprays. And these include insecticides that fall in the class of the pyrethroid class of insecticides, older, older products, the organophosphates and carbamates like seven and malathion. Um, these tend to have higher risk to beneficials, and um, they're difficult to apply to trees without causing drift that can land on other plants, or if, you're, if you've got a tree near a swimming pool or neighbor's yard that, um, that you don't want to contaminate, then that's a problem. And um, I guess the only really good thing about this is they're readily available to consumers, they're inexpensive, they are the products that most tree care companies would probably go to as a first choice for many insect problems. Then we have longer lived uh, selective foliar bark sprays. Now these are insecticides that are gonna be selective for insects. They're gonna be less toxic in general. Um, these include insect growth regulators and a few other new products that are on the market. Um, we have some question about some of these with regard to the risk to beneficials, but probably a little less risky than the uh, pyrethroid insecticides. The risk of drift, again, a little question there. Uh, it depends on, you know, it, because we are applying them as foliar sprays, they can drift, but the impact of drift on other things is questionable. And uh, the, But the big downfall of these is that they're not readily available to consumers. They're not gonna be found in the, in the big box stores or the garden centers. Um, you can buy them online, but you usually have to buy professional quantities, which might be mean a jar uh, costing $100 or more uh, over the internet. Then you have uh, systemic insecticides that can be applied to bark. Um, and uh, because you're just applying it to the lower bark of the tree, the risk to beneficials is somewhat reduced. The risk of drift is less. And um, these are somewhat available to consumers. It's still possible to find uh, uh, Dinotephran, which is probably the best example of this, this type of insecticide treatment in the stores. And then we have finally systemic treatments to soils. These kill all life stages, probably at minimal risk or at moderate risk to beneficials um, <clears throat> because you're not applying them directly to the tree. Although, as we heard last week, there, there may be some risk to pollinators because of, of uh, transfer into pollen. And then the risk of drift is practically not, nothing with these, uh, and they're relatively available to consumers. So you see we have some different options, uh, each of which has its advantages and disadvantages. When we're talking about soil application of a systemic insecticide, this is when you put the insecticide into the root zone of the soil around the tree. It's got the advantages. You don't have to be spraying. There's no drift that occurs. Uh, it goes straight into the tree, that, taken up by the tree, and fed on by the insects that are feeding on the bar, on the sap of the tree. So um, it's a pretty easy application to make. It can also be just made with a bucket of water and your insecticide and, and the soil drenched around the base of the tree. This was one of the first studies we did with uh, 
soil applied uh, systemic insecticides. In fact, it was one of the first studies we did, period, with this insect in 2008. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to show you, uh, first of all, uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, number of scales uh, per branch uh, of 35 centimeter segment of branch, which I'll be talking about throughout the presentation. And uh, this is the control plot. Uh, you can see that uh, we had uh, an average of eight scale per 35 centimeters branch in this test. And we had some treatments that resulted in more scale numbers than the control and some in less scale numbers than control. But the best treatments in this particular study were the uh, soil applications with neonicotinoid insecticides. Several products here. and Unfortunately, I'm going to be uh, jumping between trade names and, and common names for some of these insecticides, but we have Meridian, which is uh, Thymethoxam, uh, Merit, which is Imidacloprid, Safari, which is Dinotefuran, um, Meridian again, and Arena Clothiamid. And these are all examples of the uh, neonicotinoid class. And you can see they provided really good control of these scales. So it's almost like, well, we have our sil silver bullet now. Um, we can go with that. But um, I wanted to point out, it's interesting, uh, let me explain the graph here. Uh, first of all, uh, when we have bar charts like this, I'm going to show several of them today, you're going to have letters associated with the bars. Uh, the letters, if they're the same letter uh, next to a bar, that means there was no statistical difference between these, these treatments. Um, if there's, uh, if you've got a bar like here with an A and another one with a BC, that means there was a significant difference because they don't have the same letter associated with the bar. So what we see is there was no statistical difference between malathion, horticultural oil, and our control. Um, but we do see this trend with products like malathion actually having worse scales than the untreated control. And that, that could be nothing because statistically it's not significant, or it might be something. And one of the possible explanations for that is killing beneficial insects with some of these uh, insecticides, and we'll discuss that more in a minute. Now, speaking of beneficial insects, uh, these are uh, lady beetle pupae on the bark of a crepe myrtle tree. And one of the things that's obvious to any researcher that works with crepe myrtle bark scale is there are a lot of lady beetles associated with populations of bark scale. And this particular one, uh, Chilocorus cacti, is uh, also called a twice stab lady beetle because it's got these two red spots on the back of the wing covers. And uh, this, this one we're seeing feeding on, on uh, crepe myrtle bark scale very regularly. In fact, uh, this, this particular tree, um, <clears throat> this picture was taken on, was a tree that had previously been covered with bark scale by the time we took the picture after the lady beetles had been there for some time. Uh, the tree was stripped of, of scale. And looking at that tree, you, it was difficult to find live scale on the tree because of the good job the lady beetles had done. And this, um, this is, shows some promise and something um, that's going to be useful to us in our research. It also poses some challenges to researchers trying to uh, test insecticides, but we'll talk about more in a minute too. But um, in 2016, we set up a, a test to test the idea that lady beetles uh, had an impact on beneficial on these on these scale populations. And um, what we did was we set up a trial with uh, half the trees we treated with the uh, neonicotinoid insecticide called imidacloprid. Um, of those trees, we treated some with uh, an additional treatment. A, a Tree, uh, treetop treatment of either cypermethrin or carbaryl. These are sold under the names demon sometimes and uh, seven and uh, are known to insecticides known to be pretty toxic to lady beetles. And then we also uh, took the rest of the other half of our test. We did not treat it with imidacloprid as a soil drench, but we still went through the regimen of treating it with uh, demon and seven at high and low rates. And this is some of the data that we got out of that test. <clears throat> so what we're seeing here is, um, again, different treatments. And we're, uh, I want to point out first to you, this bar right in the middle is the untreated control. So this is the number of scales. And we had a lot of scales in our, treatment, in our tests this summer, this particular summer. 
um, up, up to an average of 300 scale per branch in these trials. But this was our control, untreated control trees. So this would be the, the trees uh, if no one had done anything to them. And that there, those trees were averaging uh, right here in the middle. The treatments that were, uh, the trees that received, it, received the imidacloprid treatment, the neonicotinoid, soil applied insecticide, systemic insecticide, all were statistically lower than the untreated control. Now you're saying, well, wait a minute, this bar is a little higher. This is a statistical anomaly here. We have, um, uh, we did our data actually on transform, we did our analysis on transform data. There were a few outlier uh, trees that branches that uh, threw these, this average, this numerical average off. But statistically, all of these treatments were lower than the untreated control. Now, the other thing that's interesting here is <clears throat> these were the number of scales per branch on trees that received either a demon treatment or a seven treatment. And what, what this clearly shows is a statistical difference between the trees that were treated to kill off lady beetles and the ones that were not. And uh, this, this is pretty dramatic evidence to us that um, that the lady beetles were having an impact on the scale numbers on these trees. Now, um, we wanted to look at the, the actual numbers of lady beetles, and this, this didn't turn out quite as clear as we hoped, perhaps, but uh, we did uh, two minute counts of lady beetles, adults on trees, um, to see how many, just get an average of how many uh, lady beetles were out there on these trees. And, um, <clears throat> This is the, these are the trees that were treated with imidacloprid in the soil. And you can see that they were on average much lower in numbers of uh, lady beetles than the trees that were not treated with imidacloprid. Now this could, this could possibly be due to effect of the insecticide on the lady beetles, but it could also be a, uh, a result of the fact that there just weren't any scale on these trees. And I think that's probably the main reason there were no lady beetles in these trials. Of more interest to this test, is what's taking place over here. Uh, this is the untreated control. See, we had the most lady beetles in plots that were untreated, which is what you would expect. And then the numbers start to go down uh, as we treated with seven and, and cypermethrin or decdemon. So um, this, this suggests that there was having an impact on the lady beetle numbers, but it's not clear cut statistically. Um, I think the best evidence of the impact is that previous slide we saw with the, with the very high scale numbers. Uh, in 2017, we followed, we followed the data that uh, we got off of trees in our 2016 trial. And uh, <clears throat> this was one application that was made in early season in 2016. And this is the number of, of uh, scales on branches of untreated trees. And this is the number of scales on branches and trees that were treated with mallet or imidacloprid in 2016. And what this graph shows us is there were statistical differences. At each date, we sampled the tree. And even though the overall number of scales went down significantly the second year, even going into the second year, there were statistically lower numbers of scales on our treated trees um, versus the untreated trees. So this suggests that the imidacloprid um, treatments actually last for two years. The impact can last for two years um, with this particular active ingredient. Now, um, if you were here for last week's seminar, you, you heard some information from Dr. David Held at Auburn University about uh, <clears throat> the impact of uh, neonicotinoid insecticides like this imidacloprid that works so well on uh, lady beetles, uh, or not lady beetles, on uh, residues of insecticide and pollen of uh, crepe myrtle trees. And Dr. Held is finding that th there is the uh, transfer of imidacloprid into tree pollen. And uh, the full ramifications of that are still being looked at, but um, it does at least give us some pause and think, well, maybe, maybe this isn't the best approach to controlling the scale on crepe myrtles, if they're going to hurt, if it's going to hurt bees, if there's a risk to bees and pollinators, we want to maybe come up with some alternatives. So 
really the only other alternative since we don't have non uh, toxic systemic insecticides is to go with uh, sprays that are applied to the, the canopy and branches and trunk of the tree. We, we wanted to look at some what we figured would be very t low toxicity sprays and we looked at soap. Um, we had a, a test where we uh, brushed the trees with a soft bristle brush. This is actually is a hard bristle brush. It didn't work that well. We had a soft bristled one that worked much better and we dipped it in, in soapy water and uh, and scrub down the trees basically just tried to remove as many scale as we could from the lower parts of the trees and and soap itself is an insecticide and we we hoped maybe we'd get some good kill of the scale with a soap uh, treatment we also did that in addition following it with a soap spray that it contained pyrethrins insecticides which is a very low toxicity short-lived insecticide and we had untreated controls we did this in 2018. And this is what we found. And this, this graph here shows our ratings of the tree based on how bad the sooty mold was on the tree. And uh, basically what we saw was, this is pre-treatment sooty mold ratings and all the treatment treated trees are basically the same, no significant differences. This was 18 weeks after we uh, washed the trees down. This is the, the sooty mold on untreated trees. You see it actually had gone up from the pre-treatment ratings. Uh, and the, the treated trees with uh, soap actually went down. So the trees look better. Uh, there was not numerical statistical differences, but I can tell you the trees look better. Um, we, we also looked to see if there was an impact on the scale on the branches of the tree. And basically there was NSD means no significant difference on all dates. There was no difference amongst the treatments in scale numbers. So the, the washing the trees really didn't have any impact on the number of scales on those trees. This was uh, some research we did in 2017. And again, looking at other treatments for a crepe myrtle bark scale. And we looked at uh, some, a standard treatment called Tau-Star, which is the active ingredients of pyrethroid insecticide called uh, bifenthrin. And uh, we, we looked at another new product called Expire. And then we looked at uh, some combinations with two um, promising uh, insect growth regulator products called fulcrum and talus. The best foliar treatments we found were the fulcrum and talus treatments. And these, uh, these are interesting, intriguing because of very low toxicity sprays. Um, <clears throat> they seem to work really well and they were equivalent in control to the imidacloprid treatment that we included as a standard treatment here. So we think we have uh, some good foliar sprays with this. And in this particular test, Talstar did not work that well. And um, it may, uh, the, the timing on, and the effectiveness of some of these pyrethroid insecticides may be um, due in part to the timing and where we spray the tree and if we spray the tree with the crawlers and nymphs present or not. So we have, a, we have a winner in terms of a control agent on trees, and that's the neonicotinoid insecticides. At least two of these are, are available to consumers, uh, the Bayer tree and shrub insect control, and there's another one called Safari, which is a little less common to find in the stores. But I do have a YouTube demonstration on how to treat your crepe myrtle tree with, with these insecticides. All, all it takes is what you see in this picture here, some rubber gloves, a bucket, and your insecticide in a measuring cup, and it's a fairly easy treatment. It just takes a couple minutes to do. So summary, uh, soil applied neonicotinoids apply, provide good control with up to two seasons control with, with the active ingredient imidacloprid. Applying uh, in spring before the bloom is effective. And uh, building on Dr. Held's research last Last week, it may be the least impactful timing of treatment uh, to control pollinators. Um, we can we can certainly control um, scale with a later season application, but um, if flowers are present, the label actually prohibits those kinds of applications due to pollinator protection. Uh, Bupropion, which was uh, uh, Alice. Uh, pyroproxifen, which is fulcrum, those two insect growth regulators, and another insecticide that we've uh, added uh, based on the last two summers of research, flupyrodifurone, have uh, provided significant control over multiple year studies. Uh, we do need to 
look at the impact of the sprays on beneficial insects and, and uh, determining best timing. But right now, those those active ingredients look like winners and provide an alternative to the soil applied neonicotinoids. Soap scrubs, even though uh, I couldn't show any statistical difference in numbers of scales, they do help the trees look better. Um, so if aesthetics is the main damage that's being done by these scales and you have a tree that you're trying to uh, showcase in your landscape, I, I would encourage you to consider using soap scrubs with a soft bristled brush uh, in the spring and maybe in the summer. And uh, we know that lady beetles provide control on trees that are not treated, but they may not prevent uh, sooty mold formation. Well, some of these trees still do not look that great after lady beetles have, have been doing their work because they just aren't quite fast enough for us, uh, but they certainly are beneficial insects. And I just had to throw this picture in. This uh, I had showed this um, crepe myrtle tree a couple from several years ago. Actually, this picture was taken in my neighbor's yard in 2010. Um, <clears throat> this tree has been pulled or uh, cut back severely every year since 2010. And I just wanted to show you the difference and ask a uh, rhetorical question: Who's the bigger pest, the humans? or the insects in this particular case, as far as blooms go. <laughs> um, so anyway, with that, uh, Mung Mung, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Hey, Mike, is uh, today your birthday? Yes, it is. Oh, well, happy birthday. Hey, happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Airphone, you're I'll become uh... a senior citizen today. <laughs> Airphone, you have uh, control now. I have the control, yes. yeah. Uh, let's see, y'all can see my screen. Yep. Y'all can see my laser pointer here. Yes, beautiful. All right, all right, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, I think that was a nice introduction and segue into some of the stuff that I kind of focused on, which is a little bit more on containerized crepe myrtle uh, bark seal treatments. So you'll notice there are some slight differences, you know, in terms of, you know, what worked and what didn't. I think we have a lot of similar results, but in terms of whether you choose to spray or not, you know, when it comes to nursery uh, management of criminal bark scale, as soon as you get those white spots on there, it's going to be, as you've seen with, you know, now it's uh, two talks that we've seen uh, both Mike's and uh, Dr. Daryl Harp that talked about using, trying to use physical control and it's labor intensive and it can help Im improve the looks of it, but when you're selling that whole plant, it may be considered uh, insufficient. So for you, if you have any history of creep myrtle bark scale, it's vital to, to prevent it from happening, prevent that population from ever establishing egg sacs or male pupa, so you don't get those white spots on there uh, in the first place. So we know now that it's, it's quite possible that creep myrtle bark scale is overwintering, that is surviving the winter, uh, as a nymph. So you can see here this cluster of nymphs. This is a quite a cool day on February 26th here in East Texas. And uh, at some point, the ones that survived that winter cooling are going to uh, produce egg sacs, those of these that are females. And uh, those egg sacs out of them then will come those first uh, crawlers. It may be possible, and I think in a lot of our data, there's like a very early, I'm going to say peak, but it's like a tiny little blip in crawlers that I suspect is that that very, very first generation that's hard to detect. Uh, but it's this this first emergence of all these eggs of the crawlers that come out that we want to target those crawlers before they all become egg sacs, because that's when you really start to uh, notice them. So here they are in their egg sacs. They are protected at this point and they are not feeding. So whether your spring something needs to be eaten or something that needs to contact them, uh, it's too late for this stage. So that's why we want to try and hit them before this happens. We open this up, you know, here are the eggs within the egg sac. Uh, we know that each of these females can produce 250 and or more uh, offspring for female. So you know, we might see a, a population, substantial population increase after that that we want to manage. So just a quick little overview, right? So on the left side here, we see a very high infestation, which is what we want to certainly uh, prevent. Uh, here in the middle, we see the female egg sacs are quite large and round, whereas the male pupa are quite a bit smaller and more elongated. And on the far right here are these immatures uh, that are basically vulnerable. These are the ones we want to hit before they 
develop their waxy coating and, and become basically protected. So uh, I'm going to be presenting two main kind of objectives here. One is looking at the population dynamics, and uh, Dr. Merchant had already presented some of their McKinney data, and I'm going to show uh, all of our data consolidated over several regions and what we've found uh, so far. And then we're going to look at a number of insecticide trials uh, that, that we have done and, and some of the results from there. So when we're doing population dynamics, you know, Dr. Merchant has already shown that we use this double-sided sticky tape. You can see this is highly technical entomological uh, tools right here that we get from a local hardware store. You wrap that around the branch. In this case, we had to wrap uh, at least five branches uh, on each tree and at least three trees per location. We replace that tape on a weekly basis. So you cut it off, put it on a piece of grid paper, put up another a uh, piece of double-sided sticky tape, and then we count the crawlers. So here are the, the crawlers on that tape. This gives us an idea of the relative abundance or relative change in crawlers throughout the season, so whether they are increasing or decreasing. So again, it just gives us an idea of the population dynamics in a way. And we looked at this uh, across several different locations, right? So we got Dallas, Tyler, Huntsville, and College Station, Texas. We've got Shreveport and Huma, Louisiana. We do also have some limited data from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas as well. And this data and uh, this information is all published in the Journal of Environmental Horticulture. So you can actually scan this QR tag to get to the publication if you wanna see more details about this study. If you're a data and or numbers nerd and wanna actually analyze this data yourself, uh, the data, the raw data for this is also freely available uh, on Mendeley Data. So you can go there and I'll give you a description of the, um, the Excel spreadsheets and uh, what's all in there. But uh, here, so you can see several different graphs, right? Each of these represents a different location. So this is Tyler, Texas, College Station, so on and so forth. On the x-axis, we have time within a year, so from January to December. And then on the y-axis, we have the average number of crepe myrtle bark scale crawlers counted on those trees. So each of these dots represents a, a particular average within each of those locations. If there are no dots, it means that there was no sampling done uh, during that particular period of time in that particular location. And so if we look at just 2015 alone across all these locations, you'll notice that all of them start to increase towards a peak. So here, Tyler starts to increase towards a peak. College Station starts to increase towards a peak, so on and so forth, between around mid-March to beginning of May. You'll notice uh, this beginning of May here is an emerging pattern. As Dr. Mike uh, Merchant had also mentioned in McKinney, that was something that they saw year after year, that those peaks started to increase around the beginning of May or end of April. You'll see here in 2016, a similar pattern. In this case, it's a lot tighter between uh, mid-April to beginning of May. Again, we can see that, in, that uh, number of crawlers are starting to, starting to increase towards a peak. Sometimes a peak occurs within that range, but at, at the least it's starting within that range. In 2017 data, we can also see now, in this case, it starts around mid-March to beginning of April, so perhaps a little bit earlier uh, but if we put all of those three together, all three of those years, you can see those crawlers begin to peak from mid-March to beginning of May. So this is kind of the window that you want to look at. We tried seeing whether there is um, a relationship with uh, climate. Uh, it might be because climate is perhaps a bit too similar between these regions. Maybe our climate data was not uh, sufficiently good, but we couldn't use climate as a good predictor. Uh, of when these crawlers emerge. So for now, it's kind of a you know calendar date. Uh, ideally, if you can monitor yourself, if you have double-sided sticky tape and start to notice an increase in crawlers, uh, then that's kind of when you want to target your uh, contact spray applications. That's when you want to get them. So this is where you'll see a lot of our trials, uh, our contact spray applications around that time. When it comes to a drench, it can take a little while to get up in the tree, between 30 to 60 days. So we were basically doing those drenches as early as we can when those plants are just starting to bud out. Now, if you're starting to do it too early, as we saw from Dr. Held's presentation, it seems that it can have a more negative impact on pollinators. So that's something to take into consideration. We've also noticed anecdotally, a lot of people uh, observed that it looks like the criminal bark scale moves from the bottom of the tree to the op upper part of the tree throughout the year. So you'll see here as an example, a crepe myrtle tree 
and some tapes have been placed down here at the lower part and some tapes at the upper part. Another reason why we did this was because uh, we want to standardize our protocol across all regions. And so we said, let's place our tape at chest height. The problem is that chest height for different people on the team is very different, right? So here's, here's our lower branch chest height and here's our upper branch chest height, right? So there can be a huge variation. So we want to know, does it really matter uh, if you're placing those tapes like kind of lowish or kind of high-ish up on the tree? And so this was done in College Station, right? Uh, this is Dr. Gu and her crew had collected this data uh, 12 different trees, some uh, some of those tapes on lower branches, some on upper. This is going to be an unpleasant slide to look at, but just follow me here. These are the 12 trees, each of these boxes. And we can see on the x-axis, in the bottom of all of them is date, and the y is average number of crepe myrtle bark scale per square centimeter of sticky tape. And the red are the lower branches, and the black are the upper branches. And the takeaway here is you'll notice that the red lines and black lines, for the most part, trace each other pretty closely. So in other words, it doesn't really matter if you place that tape on the lower part or the upper part, you're going to get pretty similar monitoring results uh, between uh, those upper and lower branches. So it doesn't really matter all that much where you place that, um, that tape. Now, we're getting on to insecticidal control, our very first one being in the landscape. This is the only trial that we have done in the landscape. You can access the full details of this study and this publication here with this QR code. Uh, but you can see this one location had over, you know, 70 crepe myrtle trees that all had reasonable infestation. So we picked the ones that had good levels of infestation and used them uh, in our trial. These are our different treatments here. I'm going to mention this here um, once that any mention of trade names here right, is for convenience and is not some kind of an endorsement or recommendation. I want you to look at the, the data to determine for yourself whether this is uh, an insecticide considered um, something that you'd want to use in your rotation. Um, but here are the different products that we tried out. Um, a couple different neonicotinoids that Dr. Mike Merchant had already discussed as well. Uh, oil and azadiractin. So this is uh, soft oil and malt X, which uh, we had discussed, I believe it was a couple webinars ago, uh, how Dr. Merchant and I both had uh, pretty relatively poor results, as we'll see here, in terms of suppression. We also have acephate and bifenthrin, which is, uh, this one here is a pyrethroid, which as Dr. Mike Merchant mentioned, is, is pretty broad spectrum. So how we assessed uh, whether things worked or not, uh, Dr. Patrick Ridzak, who's now Dr. Patrick Ridzak, uh, places double-sided sticky tape around those branches and would collect them weekly. Uh, the insecticides, the contact insecticides were applied twice on a two-week interval. All right, so that's our Suffol, Molt X, Talstar, and Acephate. And our drenches were just poured by a bucket around the base of the tree just a single time. You'll see uh, sometimes if there was a bit of mulch or a bit of a, a slope, we would actually, you know, trench around there, dump it so that that water, uh, so our insecticide wasn't just kind of um, washing away. We want to make sure it actually goes down into the soil right there. So here's the data. So on the x-axis is the date. On the y, we have median crepe myrtle bark scale. It's a measure of average uh, per square centimeter. And just, uh, I'll kind of walk you through all this here. So we got the first and second spray applications. You can see here initially the number of crepe bark scale uh, crawlers is very low, presumably uh, because they are in egg sacs at this point. We can see an all of a sudden an increase. So as a general pattern, we see this peak, right? And this peak begins near mid to end of April, peaks around beginning of May, goes down. We have this second subsequent peak later on, and also goes down may have a third uh, subsequent peak a little later as well. If we look at just the water, right? So this is if you do nothing, right? Or, or just spray Tyler City water, which I guess can be considered something. Uh, but if you're spraying no active ingredients really on that tree, you can see here this general trend, right? So it increases, decreases, increases again, and decreases. Now, if we compare that, say, to acephate, which is this red, you can see acephate almost increases more than the water decreases, increases again, seemingly more than the water and decreases. It's possible in this case that these are not significantly different. So maybe it's just they both increase at a very high level. It's also possible we killed a lot of the beneficials with this one, as we saw in Dr. Merchant's uh, trial, that by killing the beneficials, you can get a two to three, maybe even fourfold increase in the number of scale. 
We also see Merit and Safari, our two drenches, also increase quite a bit. But then after, let's say around June, beginning of June, those two purple colors disappear off of our graph, right? So this reaffirms again that it takes about 60 days for it to be effective. And then you literally do not see those scale on those trees anymore. And if we look at uh, Tau star or Bifenthrin, you can see we do get short-term suppression, right? So that number goes up a little bit and boom, it's knocked right down, stays down. We do get a second peak, not quite as large as the uh, untreated control. And lastly, our soft oil, you can see here compared to the water, we might be getting some suppression, right? And this is applied twice. Uh, you can see here later on again, might be getting some suppression, but not really a good control. Well, let's go on after that. We also did some flower counts, right? So there's been a lot of um, observations or, or anecdotal accounts that infestation with crepe myrtle bark scale uh, reduces flowering. So we tried to do a little quick assessment right here near the end of the trial. Now, now just remember that you know, our acephate and our neonicotinoids has very high populations of crepe myrtle bark scale early on, but not later on. Uh, our bifenthrin, for the most part, our tau star had relatively low numbers throughout the entire trial. And if we look at the number of flowers on those two dates, none of these are significantly different from each other. Okay, so within each of these dates. And so, and this is going back to what Dr. Merchant was saying, we're talking significant difference. This is uh, statistically, right? So each of these bars represents an average of several numbers. And these vertical bars here represent uh, some, some measure of variance around that mean. So you have some numbers, even though there's an average that are quite low and some that are quite high. So when you take that into consideration, you say, well, these are not necessarily uh, different from each other. They could be considered quite similar. So we don't actually get any significant differences there. And you can see here, even our, uh, our water, which uh, has gonna have relatively high scale, our acephate that's gonna have relatively high scale, um, both have a reasonable number of flowers compared to say Talstar that had you know, reasonably a low number of scale throughout the whole trial. So I don't know, it'd be interesting to see if there's some more, if we can collect some more data on whether scale does actually reduce flowering and, and what density of scale do you need to actually see some significant redu a reduction in flowering. All right, in this next trial here, uh, the purpose of this slide is not for us to go through all of it, but uh, you can take a quick screenshot if you like. You can go to our publication here in the bottom right, or if you're watching this webinar recorded afterwards, you can pause it here to see the details of, of uh, all the different treatments we did in a container trial in 2017. So here's our uh, nursery pad here in 2017. We had just set up these stakes. And you'll see a little bit later on, we get a a bit better system going on. But this is the whole, this is all the data from that year, but I'm gonna kind of break it down for you, starting off with our control, right? So this is just our, our water treatment uh, at zero days after our initial treatment. So this is basically the start of the trial. You can see our average number of crepe myrtle bark scale crawlers per square centimeter. It increases, peaks, goes down and goes down. As, you know, again, we've seen this pattern over and over again. Uh, this is nothing uh, new to you. Bifenthrin and dinotiferin, this is a, a pyrethroid, right, that we sprayed twice, okay, and dinotiferin we applied as a drench. This is now what I refer to as the nuket option, all right? So this is, if you really need to make sure things stay clean or, or are gonna be clean, uh, you can do this. This is going kind of all out. And again, you're doing your drench very early and your bifenthrin sprays twice. And you can see here, um, you know, we have some crawlers there at the beginning, but then it's, it's you know, stays very low throughout the rest of the season. We also have some of our other effective treatments again. So this is dinotefrin just as a drench. So like a safari drench. This is safari as a bark spray. So if it's more convenient for you to uh, apply it as a spray application rather than a drench, we didn't get quite as good control as our nuket option, but still uh, provides pretty good long-term control. We also have pyroproxifen, which is uh, Dr. Merchant had mentioned earlier as well, and buprovazine. So pyroproxifen is like fulcrum or distance, buprovazine being talus. Uh, we can see we also get some very good control from those. So this is uh, seven weeks after, this is our buprovazine, this is our pyroproxifen, both provide very good control. We also see cyanotranilaprol, which is like mainspring, and flupyrodifferone, which is altus that Dr. Merchant had also mentioned that added altus to that mix. 
because it seems like we get some pretty good suppression. Mainspring also appears to provide some reasonable suppression as well. However, it's maybe not as good control as some of the others. So it depends on the level of control that you're needing here. Any others that I did not mention, that includes, um, that includes things like our, um, some of our biologicals did not really provide uh, great control. So I will kind of keep going on from there. Again, purpose of this slide is not to go through it, but you can pause it later on or take a screenshot or you can visit the publication here in the bottom right by visiting that QR tag. We're gonna walk through this data here. So there's another containerized trial in 2018. You can see uh, this is our the full data, the week number and average number of crate metal bark scale per square centimeter of tape per day. And so we're only gonna look at, I'm gonna kind of break this down for you and just look at this data here and this data here. because the most important points is the very beginning of the trial or the trees all similar. And then when you actually start to get high numbers on the control, because that's when you can compare it to your insecticide treatments. Uh, let me see if I can, the right part of my screen here is being blocked by the GoToWebinar control panel. So I can't even see. Uh, there is a uh, there is an orange. Well, it's really there. Uh, we go. I minimized okay. it. Yeah, I got it. I was trying to get it minimized. All right. Um, so our treatments. So you can see here, all of our treatments uh, start very similar numbers. Uh, by August 28th, you can see our untreated numbers get pretty high. Are again, no surprise. Donutefron quite low. Distance pyroproxifen worked very well, and bupropicine also worked very well. So that's that's no surprise, right? So at this point, we're calling these our, our positive controls, right? So uh, this is our way of determining whether our trial, our experiment, actually worked. Is if these positives still work? If they don't, then we have some other, perhaps some other issue going on. If we look at our starting populations here, in this case. Our Altus, one of the treatments, started off with pretty high numbers. So to see it actually quite low later on and to see the lower rate quite low again, this provides some promise that is, again, pretty good at suppressing our, um, our criminal bar scale numbers. As a guard with his, which is azadiractin, we can see yet again um, provided basically, in this case, no suppression of the creep myrtle bark scale. And lastly, we did try uh, Ventigro, which is a fitopyropin, relatively new product from BASF, which has not really provided a great uh, suppression, at least uh, not in this trial. And lastly, a couple new products from OHP. This one's Ceresa, also, well, now known as Ceresa by then. Uh, at that time, it was just a chemical name. This one's Pradia. Uh, we can see here it might be providing some suppression but it's not super reliable. It's not some of our, like some of our other ones that um, provide very good control. And so here's, you know, on the left side and right side, you can see the difference between our nuket option on the right side and the left side, uh, you know, our untreated checks. You can see there's a huge aesthetic difference uh, when it comes to these treatments as well, which is ultimately, you know, what's really important when we go to sell these plants. And so, you know, we also jumped on the whole maybe physical scrubbing bandwagon, right? And decided to see if we can actually clean these up. So this is Dr. Patrick Ridzak doing some scrubbing of these trees. We tried a few different things like hydrogen peroxide and soap. And this is more of a proof of concept more than an actual uh, controlled trial. So please uh, refer back to Dr. Harp or Dr. Merchant's work uh, when it comes to physical controls. But we found it, at least in the nursery setting, gonna be very time consuming, very labor intensive. And it's the equivalent of trying to put out a fire, you know, with a small little hose. So it's it's perhaps not considered the most uh, effective or economic um, solution in a nursery setting, right? And the landscape is, is, again, a very different story. And you might be better off bumping up those trees, waiting for it to shut off the bark and try and clean it up for the next year. And now we currently have another trial going on uh, at the moment. So this is hot off the press, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this uh, is, we have two different kind of trials going on. This is uh, a Queen's Lace. We have 11 treatments, uh, eight different replications. You hear those treatments at the moment. So we do have that Nukem option again, which is that combination in this case of Dinoteferin and Bupropicine uh, and several other treatments, which we'll kind of go through a little bit here. And this second one, which is Pokemoke, these are uh, a dwarf crepe myrtles. We want to know if you have a dwarf crepe myrtle, it's a thicker canopy, uh, you're gonna get similar kind of results. And we have several, uh, seven treatments here. 
and here are our different treatments. I want to stress in this point that this is preliminary data, right? So we are still uh, analyzing it. We're still looking at all the different life stages to get a whole picture. So do not uh, take this and run with it. So uh, when we're looking at the queen's lace, this is just the number of male pupa. So this is actually counting them directly on the tree using a head lens. Uh, so this is the very beginning of the trial. We can see very similar numbers uh, between the different treatments that I'm showing here. As we go on to June 18th, you can see the untreated check is very high. Nucum option, very low. Uh, our imidacloprid, very low. Talus, which is just the buprovazine, very low. We can also see, whoop, uh, yet again, that um, flu pyrodifferone or Altus uh, has very, seems like very good suppression as well. When we start looking at, so we got Ventigra this time, uh, and we have ultra pure oil and Ventigra used kind of in a rotation. Uh, and these appear to be providing some good suppression, again, based on the preliminary results. Uh, we also have this new product called Velifer, which is a Bovaria bassiana. Uh, which does not seem to be providing a very good suppression. When we're looking at the Pokemoak now, so this is our dwarf crepe myrtles, you can see an uh, average number of male pupa, quite high. Nucum option, again, boom, just nothing there. Uh, our buprofacin, also very low. You'll see here the merit, uh, in this case the metacloprid, actually, you know, it did did suppress it, but surprisingly is quite high for what we've seen before. And actually, I think I, I failed to point out in one of the earlier trials, we did have another case too where metacloprid, for whatever reason, did not perform uh, in, in, you know, as, as we would expect it. There's one trial that Dr. Mer M Mike Merchant did as well, where he was excluding the lady beetles. If you notice, there was one anomaly with the metacloprid as well, that there was relatively high numbers of scale. So I can't quite explain that. I'm not exactly sure why, what conditions would make it so that imidacloprid does not always suppress the scale quite as effectively. But that is an observation that we have noticed and something to take note of. And lastly, we do have uh, Expire, which is a product from Dow, or now known as Corteva. We can see on the low rate provides quite, uh, quite good suppression. Uh, and these other two rates as well seems to provide good suppression. But again, this, this is a preliminary. We'll, we need to look a little bit um, at the whole data to see uh, kind of how Expire is performing. So if there's any takeaway, here's a quick snapshot of all the trials we have done. Uh, and here's a product trade name. Again, not an endorsement of these products. It's just there for convenience. Some, several of these do have generics. And so I do encourage you to look at the generics and all of the options as well. The active ingredient listed here, the mode of action group. So make sure you're rotating to prevent uh, insecticide resistance. The application method, whether it's a drench or a bark spray. The frequency of applications, at least in our trials, and how well it worked. So again, that's something you might want to consider. Um, you know, it's already been mentioned several times in these webinars. You know, all this types of information is available on stopcmbs.com. If you go to updates, uh, a lot of the uh, you know researchers are providing kind of quick little snapshots of some of their work. So I did one on the containerized. Uh, criminal bar scale trial and contains that exact summary that I just showed you there uh, that, in, that, in that slide. So you can quickly access it there. And I'm going to just keep this post kind of updated as, as our trials go on. So that'll be kind of a source of quick information on, um, you know, insecticides uh, for containerized criminal bark scale uh, efficacy. And I just want to thank uh, all the people that helped collect and count all those scale, all the colleagues and our funding agencies. And that's all. Well, thank you, Erfang. Um, 